Welcome to Trekosophy, the Star Trek philosophy podcast. It's episode number 21 for November 25th, 2012. Joining me this evening, we have the guy that Lieutenant Barkley says spends way too much time in the holodeck. It's Chris McGee. Good evening. And also joining us this evening, Vic Fontaine's backup percussionist, Ben McLean. Bada bing, bada bang, bada boom. And I am Bill Allen, a.k.a. the guy in the red shirt. And we're going to talk about the holodecks. So the holodeck is probably one of the niftiest gimmicks from a storytelling point of view to come along. This allows you to play with reality and twist things around without having a lot of the silly contrived plots where we accidentally went back in time again and it's the 1800s, it's the 1900s, it's the, you know, it uh, helps you do those odd off-the-wall stories without having to have a disaster that could threaten the entire universe and imploding in a space-time paradox limbo. Go anywhere, yeah. do anything. Exactly. And uh, I'm sure the first time the holodecks were introduced in the Next Generation, first episode as a matter of fact, everybody who watched the show probably immediately uh, had other ideas for using the holodeck, which really got to their fruition in Deep Space Nine in Hollow Suites. Yeah. <laughs> Way to keep it PG there. I did the best I could. Yeah. Well, um, he's subtly referencing a, a another use for holodecks, which can bring any fantasy to life. Yeah. Uh, wink, wink, nudge, that, nudge. People did write about that quite a bit. Um, but Star Trek didn't even start that, did they? I mean, that was in Brave New World by Huxley. The whole thing about the the feelies um, in Brave New World is is the same thing, really. He didn't have the concept of holography, but he had the concept of simulated reality. Yeah, Even, the idea uh, of VR has been around for a long time going well, all Well, yeah, but I meant, back. you know, for that. <laughs> oh, no, oh, that specifically type of, uh, yeah. yeah. That, that was in Brave New World by Huxley, is my saying. I really think the whole idea of uh, of a fake simulated reality really goes back to Plato and the allegory of the cave that everything we know is uh you know is shadows and, and isn't real whether you believe Plato's correct or not about the life we live now the uh the holodeck enables us to construct a situation that is philosophically the equivalent of Plato's cave in that we could uh realistically create a, a world someone lives in uh, in which everything they think they know is a lie because we control the environment around them. And so this total control over your environment and your experience is, uh, you know, it really gives someone the power of God if you think about it. I mean, it's uh, so it's probably really, if you think about it, it's probably more powerful than all the enterprises, phasers and and missiles and uh, antimatter explosions and whatnot, is this power of deception that the holodeck could give them potentially. And I'm surprised they don't use it more often to try and just sort of fool aliens into having the beliefs they want them to have uh, using the holodeck. Seems like an obvious use for it. Well, when when the show first came out, the holodeck was one room on the ship, and you needed to be in the holodeck for the illusion to work. Mm -hmm. Doing it outside the room made it tricky, which you got to sneak the alien in, fool him, and then sneak well, him out again. Transporter. Yeah. They did do that in uh, the episode Future Imperfect, I believe, where they uh, abducted Riker and made him – Try to give away a secret location of a star base uh, by putting them in a Romulan holodeck, and of course the whole trick was even that was not real. But yes, and, illusion uh, behind an illusion behind an illusion. Those are the best kind. And then, yeah, and then they did that in uh, in DS Nine as well. Um, at one point, the whole thing with trying to recruit. 
the doctor, uh, Dr. Bashir, into Section 31. Uh, they they used that technique then as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tried to uh, mimic his real life down to little details, but it was the little details that messed them up in the end. And then, of course, uh, they used yeah. the holodeck against a holodeck character, uh, Dr. Moriarty. Yeah, one of these days we have to do an episode just on Dr. Moriarty. <laughs> it's Professor, I Professor, think. Professor, pardon me. Sorry, Professor Moriarty, because we've already talked about the doctor. We've talked about data. Let's talk about we'll, – we'll have to get to him at some point. Remind me to add that to the list. Did we do the doctor from No, from we Voyager? haven't done that one yet. That's on the list. Yeah, I mean we did the doctors, you know, Star Trek doctors in general, but we haven't done a, an episode specifically on the doctor yet. We need to do that still. We will. Yeah. All right, so back on um, – So the holodeck. Um, holodeck. Yeah, so we are talking about how the holodeck – you know, creates things here. It it converts energy into matter, uh, but it's not a permanent form of matter, which is kind of the gotcha about holidays. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that the holiday gives us, really, if you think about it, is the dream of slavery from the beginning of having disposable people who will do whatever you say. Uh, the holodeck, you know, gets supposedly gets you that, and supposedly free of consequences. Except we see sometimes that even uh, it still even has uh, consequences. But it's a uh, lust for power that people have always had. That they want that they want uh, in different ways. Uh, that we've always wanted disposable people to do what we want. You know. Well, what do you mean? Like a person goes into the holodeck and just pretends he's the king of his own little world there? Uh, well, I mean, you create and destroy at least what appear to you to be people. Okay. Uh, they're made of photons and, and so on, but they at least appear to you to be people. And they're essentially your slaves because they'll they'll do whatever you tell the computer they should do. And so it, it, basically, make, it basically gets you slavery without – having to actually take care of the slaves. They disappear when you mm -hmm. uh, clap your hands. And we've seen it used as training for Worf and whoever else is there to dispatch uh, holographic enemies. Um, so I guess in a way you could harm someone in a holodeck and it not be real. It'd be like, like the next evolution of video games. And, you know, there's already enough outcry these days from parents claiming that video games are, or maybe not parents, but uh, legislators anyway, uh, claiming that video games are just too violent for children. Well, there it desensitizes are. them. Can you imagine if they're actually doing it to someone who looks and feels real? <laughs> well, there are both. I mean, parents and legislators who say that. And, and I think, especially with Doom, there was some merit to that. I'm, uh, as a, you know, as a programmer, I have a huge admiration for the Doom engine and uh, somebody interested in games, I, I have a huge admiration even for Romero's level designs, mm -hmm. uh, John Romero, the level designer. But the art that was in Doom was of a pretty violent and unnecessarily violent and satanic nature. And uh, so I, I can understand a lot of the objections to, uh, to Doom that, that went around. On the other hand, a lot of it was very uninformed. I mean, a lot of the stuff, like, could have been dispelled just by actually booting the thing up and you know and trying it out and seeing for yourself you know because there was a lot of false crap that went around mm -hmm. but on the other hand i mean i can see the le legitimate concerns on both sides of that issue uh, though even though i i recognize that that uh jack thompson guy is is a freaking idiot and should die <laughs> thank you <laughs> oh yeah that guy i think he's already been disbarred by now hasn't he yeah yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> uh thank there God. was a story he actually said he'd pay a million dollars to anybody who would design a video game where a disgruntled customer bought a video game didn't like it goes to that software company's headquarters with a shotgun and starts shooting all the software developers he wanted – he says, make a game where you guys are the victims of the violence and, and see if you like it, and I'll pay you for it. And some company actually did that, and he never paid them. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, the charities didn't miss out, though, because somebody else paid them 
on behalf yeah. of him. <laughs> uh, right, I kind of remember that now. Yeah, and, and the thing is, Doom 2 actually did that. There's an Easter egg where you actually get to uh, kill John Romero in, in Doom 2. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that one. Okay, uh, but, well, uh, setting aside the violence anyway, go ahead, Bill. Well, I was going to steer us back towards the holodeck and that video game connection. Yeah. Um, in a lot of ways, when you see the holodeck getting used, it's, it's not just about slavery. It's... Um, it's the new novel for the 24th century. It's the ultimate interactive story because look at how it gets used so often by so many characters. They're, they're recreating their favorite serialized dramas from a bygone era. Data preferred to be Sherlock Holmes. Picard was Dixon Hill. Tom Paris was Captain Proton. Right. <laughs> the, the holodeck takes – immersive storytelling to the next level so yeah you could say that those characters were were people but they were characters and it's that question of uh uh how how in-depth and out of touch with reality do you want to get how immersive do you want your because for you to see them as as slaves and to have that power trip you'd have to think of them as real people and not just characters because in so many ways they're generic backdrop props they're not hold on though a lot of times when a lot of times when we had real world slavery that is exactly how a lot of the aristocracy thought of slaves as background props now i'm not saying uh, we know that at least within the context of the story holodeck characters are not sentient but I am just saying it, it is worth considering. Uh, at least some some holodeck characters do become sentient in the uh, series. And aren't you running the risk of creating a sentient uh, holodeck character anytime you use the holodeck, and in which which would get deleted uh, without you knowing it? Well, see, that brings up an interesting uh, topic about uh, is a holographic character real or not? If We've given them sentience. Does that make them a real person? Do we have to treat them like a person and so forth? And that may actually be in its own episode. <laughs> and a, yeah, but, a, and a, you know, and, and, and that uh, we, we got into that during the data episode. But we'll probably well, get into it more with the Moriarty. Yeah, Moriarty. Um, when it comes to sentient holographic characters – there, there, there's a few different ways it's happened. Uh, extended use, that's what happened with the doctor. It was meant to be mm-hmm. a complex program to begin with, but that, that sentience, that sense of self didn't kick on until it stayed running for a really long time. Then you have those that were accidentally created in the case of Moriarty. They needed someone who could defeat data and... What's data got? Self-awareness. So the computer had to figure out a way to make it self-aware. And then you've got those that were intentionally created to be self-aware holograms like Vic Fontaine. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But, but the rest of the characters, they're not really there to that same extent. They're, they're, there's a limited dialogue tree. Look at uh, – one of the first season episodes of the holodeck had uh, Tasha Yar demonstrating the holodeck to a visiting dignitary, and she creates a ninja for the uh, training program. And the guy says, oh, you can create people out of thin air. And she says, it's not really a person. She looks at a hologram and says, what's your name? You know, who are you? How do you feel? And it just stands there because it's a fighting program. That was also before the upgrade, which took place in one one zero zero one zero zero one. Yeah, they. Uh, that was. I forgot about Min. I think she qualifies as the intentionally created to be complex kind of thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I was. I was going to say, uh, I'm not actually accusing, you know, characters in the Star Trek universe of making, you know, creating and destroying real people every time they use the holodeck. But it does beg the question: What if they were? Would that actually would that knowledge actually modify their behavior? It, anyway, it's just, well, it's just I mean, no. It actually kind of has. I mean, I'm trying to think back to the episodes. 
that was the thing about Professor Moriarty. I mean, really, you can't just go off the holodeck and yank out the computer core and call it quits. Uh, they had to trick Moriarty a few times whenever he popped up, but basically they never even considered killing him, even though he's essentially a villain. He's it's in yeah, his that, genes to be yeah, modified what they did. Uh, but what a lot of people in the Star Trek universe would do think, you know, you know, well, anyways, it's not even so much about how we actually treat holiday characters as just a sort of drive that's inside us that, you know, and it's not just the people either. I mean, it's the, the ability to completely, to have complete unquestioned control of your environment. So you um, think it might actually start to affect the person in his real life? If he starts uh, having so of, much control in the holodeck and he starts carrying that over into his or her real life. Oh, well, obviously okay. that would be a problem. But I'm not even uh, talking about that. I'm talking about how the holodeck in this sense of how it relates to our characters – uh, and here I'm not talking of like Star Trek actor character. I'm talking about our character as in our moral character. Um, it's feeding an impulse which has historically been a, a uh, fairly uh, ignoble one in terms of you know it's it's why people wanted slavery. It's not that it is slavery, but that it is feeding the impulse that is behind why people wanted slaves. It's not that it actually they actually are slaves. It's that we want holodeck re- characters for the same reasons that people have historically wanted slaves. Well, that I can understand that, but also think about it in this light: technology right now allows us to uh, save a lot of time and effort by having machines do stuff for us. We've got machines that'll wash our clothes. Instead of having to get out a washboard and spend hours washing clothes, we got machines that'll that'll clean our dishes. We've got machines that you brew a cup of coffee with just a, a button press. Things that will kind of do the work of a person these days. That uh, then we don't have to use a person to do it. So yeah. it essentially would be like the same sort of thing. Just instead of having a mechanical process. We would be having a machine uh, using photons and force fields do it. Yeah, for. except now it looks like a person. Yeah, so you're saying there might be a psychological difference there. I think that's where I'm going with it. Um, um, I don't know if I – I mean we already mentioned uh, Mr. Thompson and his uh, anti-video game crusade. Yeah, and I'm and I, I think I'm not anti holodeck. Of... Like I said, if I was in the Star Trek universe, I'm pretty sure my occupation would probably be to be a holodeck novelist. I'm not anti holodecks, but yeah. I am just trying to get us to sort of think about what the concept of a holodeck would mean for us and for our for our psychology and for our our individual characters. And it's it's something which, while it can be a good thing, I think could be also be very, very dangerous. And not just dangerous because of, you know, like hollow addiction, which is, you know, you can get addicted to novels. I mean, you can get addicted to anything. But the 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 kind of power trip it gives you is, you know, kind of, would be kind of a lot even more extreme than anything we've ever we've ever seen before, because you can have slaves and you can treat them however you want with impunity. Or is that the right word? W- without restraint. You, you, yeah, you need absolutely no restraint at all in the holodeck. And what that does is uh, you know, it, it could go some fairly nasty places fairly quickly. And I don't mean nasty like uh, sexually immoral in the Christian sense. I mean like violent. I mean there's a lot of people who might just get off on violence. Yeah, but I don't think that it's um, the fact that the holodeck gives people that power that makes it uh, – anyone who would be a megalomaniac, anyone who would be a monster and go to that dark place, they're going to do it anyway, holodeck or no holodeck. Yeah. I don't think the holodeck can bring out the darker side of humanity 
I, I think the holodeck is just a tool that people who embrace their darker side use to express themselves. I was thinking of examples from the show of how the holodeck is used. Data does it to study humans and see, try to understand humanity. Tom Paris creates a pool hall so him and his friends have a place to hang out that lets them escape from the fact that they're trapped on a ship and might never see home again. In the episode where the Enterprise becomes alive on its own, the holodeck is what it uses to create its dreams and express its subconscious. I'm not attacking the holodeck. Uh, I just hope I'm clear on that. No, no. Uh, I, but I, I'm tra- I am saying, though, that it, it is a tool, like Bill's saying, and I'm just saying we'd have to be very careful how it's allowed to be used because that kind of stuff – I really think it could that kind of stuff can spill over into real life when it gets extreme enough. Now, I don't think uh, for most people, video games, certainly not 1990s video games, for crying out loud, is going to uh, spill over into real life with anything we've got now. But when you have the holodeck, something that can actually can literally fool people into thinking it's real. Literally, I mean, I mean, people actually get fooled into thinking it's real. That's like yeah. a whole different uh, scenario than uh, you know the 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 blocky, pixely sprites in Doom. You know, <laughs> I actually wrote a speech in uh, my college days, specifically on the topic of video game violence and whether or not it influences. Uh, children or anyone else playing it to become violent in real life. And there has been, to my knowledge as of today even, no definitive evidence showing a correlation between violent video games and violent behavior in kids. There Any time that there has been a correlation shown, the, the violent behavior in the person... Was the violence, the violent behavior was already there in the person. And the, the video games had really no effect on whether it amplified it or anything else. So, yeah, if, if that's the case, I mean, granted, these days our video games are even more graphic, uh, even more realistic. No, but, not really. Uh, I, might, I might address that. Oh, I don't want to. I shouldn't but, be interrupting. That's right. Um, but, you know, to address your point, Ben, yeah, if, if you go into the I mean, granted, it's still two dimensional on the screen. It's still pixels and so forth. But you have to admit it looks a lot better than it did 20 years ago. Uh, regardless, if you were in a holodeck and you uh, attacked what looked like an ab, you know, a real human being in there and I'm not going to get graphic here, but if if you saw blood, if you saw something that would affect you in real life, I'm sure it might actually affect you more than just a two-dimensional video game would. Sure. Uh, There's an interesting chart you might look at, and it's not not like a statistical chart. It's like one of those subjective making a point kind of things, but not really scientifically based. But it's basically, you know, a chart of of video, uh, you know, level of violence in video games by year and it has this peak right at doom and then it goes down (laughs) exactly and that's actually what's happened i mean we have like left for dead and stuff that's pretty violent but we don't have anything that's as violent in terms of its content as doom we have more realism but we don't actually have more violence uh as such at least not in the really popular titles I've seen a chart that shows basically what you described that shows a level of violence in video games and kind of peaks at doom goes down. But I've also seen it overlaid with another chart that shows violence uh, caused by teenagers um, over a year to year period so that it lines up. And right about the time that the PlayStation came out, violence committed by teenagers actually went down and pretty much stayed on a downward trend up to the current uh, decade. Yeah. I didn't want to – yeah, I, I didn't finish my, my second point, which was oh, yeah, that I, uh, I, real, I, I very strongly reject these claims that violent video games have 
some causal connection with school shootings or or whatever. Yeah, sure, the people who shot up Columbine High School all played Doom and all listened to, what was it, Metallica? But then so did all their classmates, so that doesn't tell you anything, you know, because everybody had that stuff. I mean, literally everybody. Well, maybe not absolutely, not literally. almost everybody. And so, yeah, I mean, those arguments are bogus. But when I do think that what you put in your mind has an effect on your on your psychology and what what you allow in there does affect how you think a lot of times in ways you don't notice and so i i th- and i think w- if we got to something like the holodeck i mean jack thompson's an idiot we all know that but when it would come to something like the holodeck where we get an ex- we get a, a you know a virtual experience which is literally indistinguishable from reality physically and it's only by doing our very best just to keep hold on our wits in however we can that we can sort out what's real from what's not because the the virtual is sensually indistinguishable then a lot of that argument would make a lot more sense because it, it would become reasonable that somebody wouldn't be able to sort out fantasy from reality or or be able to uh keep themselves under control uh or maybe they'll be able to keep themselves under control but it becomes you know much more difficult i mean and the thing is you'd never be able to prove it if it did happen you could show correlation but correlation doesn't show causation yeah, I, I don't agree. see as how you'd ever be able to if this was true i don't see as how you'd ever be able to prove it well this whole argument is speculative anyway yeah. but and i i think well, whole, and i hate to is. segregate <laughs> but i i think that actually the the intelligence of the individual themselves and their ability to distinguish fantasy from reality is what really uh, determines whether or not they are going to be affected by what they see, whether or not a violent video game or a violent television show movie or anything like that will affect them and make them violent. I think it's if the person was really grounded in reality and they knew the difference, I'm hoping most of the people that listen to this podcast are like this. They know that this stuff isn't real and that there's no way they would ever murder someone just for the thrill of it. Well, sure, but on the holodeck, you don't know what's real. The uh, Remember the, the, the scene with Odo and uh, Kira? And for quite a while there, Odo thinks he's talking to a holographic version of Kira. There's that one episode with Jordy LaForge on the holodeck with that lady engineer. Yeah. And uh, he has trouble sorting out because he's been carrying on this sort of almost sort of fantasy relationship with someone who turns out to be real and coming there <laughs> and uh, it runs into problems. I can see all kinds of opportunities for like, let's say entrapment, right? You, uh, you convince someone to go into this sort of holodeck simulation of something and uh, do different stuff like that mutiny simulation the that they had on Voyager and uh, you have them run through it several times and then one of the times it's not a drill but they don't realize that and you could get them to kill for you just by making them think they're in the holodeck and uh, you know there's there's all kinds of possibilities okay. uh, you know of ethical problems that the holodeck opens up, which we'd have to be very, very careful of. And I'm not saying I'm not a Luddite. I, I'm a technologist. I believe in technology. I think technology is a great and wonderful thing, and we should try to advance technology. But I do think we also have to be very careful of possible misuses and uh, just just be aware of these kind of things and uh, and uh, do what we can to uh, deal with them as they come along. And I just think it's it's something worth talking about in, in the term in the context of philosophy relating to uh, this kind of device. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
Bill, you have you've been a little quiet lately. Any thoughts? Yeah, um, what I'm thinking is, yeah, it's possible to lose track of what's real and what's not. But 90 percent of the time when that happens, like Ben says, somebody's trying to trick you. And even in reality, where there is no holodeck, people can still trick you. People still get conned into doing stuff they thought was a good idea. Usually it's involving uh, losing all your money and not actually murdering someone. But yeah, the ability to trick someone, deceive someone into believing a lie is something that happens holodeck or no. The holodeck doesn't necessarily make it easier. But the one side I would say is I think it might be a good thing that you'd be able to do more realistic violence just for the sake of of catharsis. I mean – we all have those days when we just were driving it stuck in rush hour traffic and we just really want to just make a hole. So go on the holodeck, load up the beltway, load up your nice steel reinforced Buick and floor it. It's cathartic. It would help you relieve stress and it would let you live out those dark fantasies without actually hurting anybody, even though it looks really, really, really realistic. Uh, a holodeck could be a nice treatment for for psychopaths and and crazed killers. You know the guys that start as a child torturing squirrels and then slowly work their way up to people. Most of them try to live a normal life until something sets them off, and then they go on their little murder, and then they lead a normal life again, trying to cover up what they did. So if somebody has some kind of weird psychological trigger, let them take it out on the holodeck. Well, uh, two points on that. First of all, what do you mean it would make it easier? Of course it would make it easier. It's not more or less the definition of the device. And then second, I really think the murderers, serial killers, etc., they're looking for, I think, the psychological rush of the knowledge that they have killed a real person. And I don't think uh, the holodeck is going to satisfy them. Just uh, as uh, – well, yeah, that's probably all I should say. Well, I don't know. For, for a lot of those guys, it's um, the impulse that drives them to kill. Yeah, they're looking for the rush of killing a real person, but they're not exactly rational about it. So all you got to do is satisfy that primal urge and they should be all right. Well, why do you think they're not rational about it? Because from what I've seen – in all these cop shows they have or all these unsolved mysteries type shows which talk about what these sort of people do uh, a lot of them seem very rational and meticulous about what they're doing that's how they that's how a lot of the really smart ones avoid getting caught yeah but look at the ones who have gotten caught it's like he saw a red balloon so he went out snatched up a kid stuffed him in a well somewhere you well, know, it, it's weird yeah. stuff relating to subconscious traumas and whatever triggers it, some deep-seated psychological issue that the guy can't address himself. So it stays pent up inside until something triggers it and he just has this reaction. Well, I, I think that's uh, more or less Freudian analysis. And for a number of reasons, I am somewhat anti-Freudian. But – the, the uh, there are idiots who get caught almost right away, and they're not very dangerous, uh, really. I mean, they're dangerous to that one victim, but they don't become. The serial killers are generally very meticulous at what they're doing. And another thing is they feed on the media coverage of the event. We found they they feed on the uh, on the distress that it causes the community i mean you know there's this whole thing about uh what was it jesse james didn't do this kind of thing as far as i know but jesse james you know had this thing about where he had the wanted poster of himself uh, by his bed while he was sick it's a famous old uh urban legend about billy the kid uh these guys do that they uh they feed on the real world media coverage of the trauma they have caused and uh that's caused a lot of the uh, a lot of uh families to choose to try to zip it uh, to some extent other than to find the kid 
because they don't want to encourage this sort of thing by giving it a whole bunch of attention. You know, a lot of them are attention, what you call it, attention whores or whatever you might say. But anyway, so I really don't think a lot of those kind of people would actually be helped by the holodeck because I think it would just encourage this appetite they have until they go out and do it for real. I mean, uh, that's how child porn works as well. People who are into child porn, it pushes the appetite until they uh, uh, are no longer satisfied by the porn and they go to do it for real. But so that was, I don't buy that. Well, I mean, you were saying that you know the holodeck really does become indistinguishable from reality. Well, that physically indistinguishable, sure. But I think there are some instances. I think it it's indistinguishable from reality in all the wrong ways. You know, it's indistinguishable from reality in the moment you're doing it. Well, I don't know. Maybe you might have a point there after all. Because – well, I don't know. It depends on how much these people really do value the uh, psychological aspect of it being real yeah. when they go after these sorts of things. And I, I, I'm not – I don't know enough about criminal psychology yeah, to be none sure. none of us are criminal psychologists. We and none know. of us are crazy, so there's a limit to how much we can pretend to understand the crazy. Yeah. Well, none of us are that crazy. Yeah. yeah, we have to be a little bit crazy to have a Star Trek philosophy podcast. Well, at least oh, I yes. hope none of us are that crazy. So let's okay. talk about some of the um, more positive aspects of the holodeck. The positive yeah. aspects of the holodeck. <laughs> the uh, That'd be good. Yes. Yeah. No more serial killers and losing touch with reality. Let's let's talk about the holodeck as an art form? a an art medium. Yeah, a way to express your creativity and create things that. Make life easier or just more enjoyable. Yeah, Sherlock I mean, Holmes, Dixon Hill. My favorite was Captain Proton. I mean, hmm. I did not like Voyage. Voyager was not my favorite show. I'll say it that way. I liked Voyager. It was not my favorite show, but Voyager had the best holodeck programs. Some of them, sure. I really like that Sherlock Holmes program, but that's just me. I'm a Holmesian guy. I like Holmes a lot. So, but uh, yeah, Voyager had a lot of good ones. Why has no one ever decided that they wanted to be a superhero and fly like Superman in the holodeck? It seems so such an obvious thing that the holodeck would obviously give you is the sensation of flight that a lot of people want. Yeah, that's kind of one of the things about it is that you could uh, realize all your dreams basically. Well, maybe not all your dreams, but a lot of them. Yeah, maybe just nobody's into flying on uh, on Star Trek since they pretty much do it all the time. Anytime they want to go zero G, they can go zero G. Well, we remember from the episode of DS9 in which the uh, bird lady in the wheelchair shows up that they hardly ever actually do that, and it is an actually a novelty experience to do it for Doctor Bashir to go to the zero G and and so on. But even zero G isn't quite the same thing as the Superman flight. You know, the Superman Peter Pan type flight is a dream that people have had for a long time that makes, you know, almost no sense, but we just wish it made sense, you know? But uh yeah. part of but it's not quite the same thing as zero G flight. Uh it's there's gravity, there's physics, but not for me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Back to playing God again, breaking all the rules of the universe. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> well, I just want to go on record by saying that if holodecks or holo suites were real, and like I would definitely be a Barkley, I would be probably even more holodicted than, than he was. Well, it depends on how available the holodecks are to you. Yeah, I'd probably be like that one character in Deep Space Nine and own my own. Yeah, that's the thing I'm wondering about. How <laughs> expensive are these things? I mean, they completely um, sort of replace almost everything else. I mean, it seems like it would make sense for you to build a hall house. You know? Yeah, that's... yeah, but the power to run it, maybe. 
Yeah, well, well this is they, the age of antimatter conversion. I think by the time that comes along, we'll have the juice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just seems like a technology which would replace a lot of the other stuff that that Star Trek has if they just apply it more. The replicators, the sonic showers, the you know the living quarters they have, replace them all with hollow suites, and uh, they can not only do everything they want, but they could even control the ship. I mean, I you could, could make a hollow ship where every every single room is a holodeck. That was actually um, one of my ideas for a weapon design once. Just build a giant freaking holodeck covering two or three decks that will just generate any kind of BFG you want. And since it's all just energy and force fields creating something that looks real, you just create the projection of whatever kind of super plasma torpedo cannon you want, funnel real power through it, and boom, you've got yourself a super gun on any starship. Well, that's what uh, that's what the Doctor did in uh, Voyager. Arm the photonic cannon, he said, remember? Yeah, yeah. That was a good episode. But um, for, for practical uses for that, well, I'm a pet owner, and something like that would be great for somebody in uh, – in an apartment in a crowded city, just uh, have open grassy field program number six. Dogs need to go to the bathroom. You let them into the holodeck, and they've got this huge field to run and frolic and chase rabbits. And then you don't have to worry about um, cleanup or anything. You just hose it out when they're done and it's turned off and just – Okay. You already kind of – I was going to say uh, the gears – Whatever the dog leaves behind, it's not going to just disappear with everything else when you turn off the program. Well, they it's going to have to be cleaned holodeck, up at some point. The holodeck uh, recycles all that kind of thing already. Uh, we've seen enough to realize that it does this. It actually, uh, what's it called? Uh, we've seen it uh, materialize real food, and they've left things behind in the holodeck that have gotten uh, biodegradable things. If I remember right, and behind in the holodeck that have gotten. Uh, yeah. Dematerialized, that's the word. And uh, really? so, yeah, they, it, it already does that. It, it, it works. They've said repeatedly on Star Trek that the, that the uh, holodecks work on the same principles as the transporter and the uh, replicator, which means we don't want to invent separate BS for how the holodeck works. We'll just use the existing BS. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a combination of transporter technology and hologram technology and force fields. And they, they just kind of make references to this stuff a few times to say basically a lot of it is fabricated right there on the scene. Mumbo jumbo, ooga booga hoo ha. So you could leave leave some object in there and it would act, you could turn it back to energy or something, even if it was real matter and not holodeck matter. Yeah, pretty much. It's your recycling bin and your entertainment center. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, yeah. I have to see those episodes because I don't remember them. Well, they get trapped in the holodeck for days a lot of the time. Do you think the and and then when they leave, it's it's you don't see any nasty stuff on the floor, do you? Well, you don't see any nasty stuff on the floor because it's it's prime time television. Well, also, no one in Star Trek ever has to go to the bathroom. You know that, right? So maybe we're just wrong about the bathroom in general in Star Trek because no one ever has to go to the bathroom on Star Trek. So uh, there, there have been a few references here and there to the relationship between transporters and the holodeck and things have gotten uh, beamed into and out of holodecks in reality before. Well, another thing about uh, the holodeck, which is just worth thinking about, and it's sort of one of those bizarre little asides is there's a great deal involved more than just the simulation of things we will see, touch, taste, feel, etc. Because data in elementary dear data is able to ask the computer basically to create an interpretation of classic literature. And presumably we're given we're given no real indication that he couldn't have requested any random book. Way. And the computer, just working from the text, would construct the sort of place it would be. And that seems to indicate a high level of intelligence 
in the computer to be able to sort of interpret uh, all of this information, this textual information, this language into the environment. Now, when we get into the later series, as we start talking about the sort of concept of a hollow deck novelist writer person who who constructs you know these sorts of things but uh, that didn't seem to be the concept in the early shows in the early shows it seemed to be that the computer you request it and the computer comes up with it i mean it was it was like magic it was siri on steroids it It was what also uh be the difference between having the the frontline Federation starship, which has the sum of all human knowledge loaded into its memory banks, and being some guy at a frontier outpost where the computers don't always work right, there there'd be a difference in available programs from the get go. That might be part of why you have hollow novelists mentioned later on, but not in the early episodes of the Next Generation. Okay. Well, we know that the Enterprise's computers never seem to work right, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that the computer there is conceptually doing something that we don't think about much because we're dazzled by the uh, the whole holodeck experience. But that is the computer is doing literary interpretation. And that's something that computers shouldn't be able to do as far as – I'm concerned anyway. I don't. I mean, that seems to be even more challenging to uh, c- create than the uh, sensory experience, because I mean, it's not just duplicating something humans have did, but there's actual original thought involved there, and so that's a little bit. Uh, I mean, that that more gets into the artificial intelligence subject, but yeah. that's an aspect of the holodeck which uh, no one seems to have remarked on. Anywhere, well, ever. So it's, you we're heard getting it first close here. To, we're getting close to actually having that aspect of it licked in our lifetime. I mean, um, uh, I think it's. Uh, I'm skeptical. W- <laughs> www.cleverbot.com. I've talked to Cleverbot. It doesn't <laughs> pass the, te- the the muster test. Yeah, however it, you say it. <laughs> not Turing yet. Test. Yeah, it's not. It's not a Turing capable machine, but. It is generating its own reactions to random user input. I mean, it's doing what you were talking about. And if you give it 400 years, Cleverbot will be able to do that kind of... Hmm. I, don't, I don't buy that. I've worked in... I've constructed one of those before myself as a programmer. Uh, when I was a kid, I built one of those from scratch. So I know a little bit about the what's involved... Not a not a whole lot about maybe some of the fancy newer tricks they've used, but I know a little bit about text parsing and and what's involved in that. And really, it's it's uh, not anything like what real humans actually do when we speak. It's it's based on just looking things up in a table, and there's no actual thinking involved. You know, I mean, Cleverbot is not. No matter how many words you give Cleverbot, he's never going to think. You know, whereas a baby who doesn't have any words is already thinking. Helen Keller, before she has any words, is already thinking. She's already making a leap that computers have never made and never will until and unless we get something like data, which isn't, you know, which we have no particular reason to think is real, though, you know, we like to think it's real in science fiction. But anyway, my point is that really, uh, that's like saying, oh, I built a log cabin. Now I'm going to build a tower to the moon. You know, well, no, not it doesn't quite work like that. You know, <laughs> well, if it's you look at it's not. I'd argue that there's some differences in kind and not just in degree between <coughs> Cleverbot and say Helen Keller. Well, clearly there's a lot more to discuss on this topic alone. Sure, uh, it's, it's definitely something that we'll have to come back to. In the yeah, we're going to have to jump on artificial intelligence again because mm-hmm, them's fighting mm-hmm. words. I'm a guy who loves video games, so I can tell you the uh, AI, it really is still quite stupid. <laughs> but it's um, it's more flexible and more internally creative today and designed to be a little bit more randomized today than it was 20 years ago. So you give us another... 400 years, 
what is that Moore's law? Every what is it? Every five years, the processing power will double, or was it ten years? Well, yeah, but uh, that's it's that uh, Moore's law was that computer power will basically double every eight months or something like that. Or maybe it was 18 months, something like that. Let me look up Moore's Law. That's assuming that there are no qualitative obstacles to uh, creating an intelligence and that it's all quantitative. And I, I think there's a lot of qualitative intelligence issues that we are nowhere even close to even approaching. Um, yeah, that's true. I mean, we're not talking about creating real intelligence. We're talking about simulating a facsimile that looks awfully good. So, I mean... Oh, yeah. Uh, I was talking case about where you can... the computer's act of interpreting Sherlock Holmes to construct a, uh, to construct the program of this is what Holmes... This is imagining what Holmes's rooms would actually look like. And the computer's taking what's in Doyle and then extrapolating from that a real place and, and imagining what that place would look like that's there's there's an act there's acts of creativity and artistry involved there and literary interpretation which is more than just uh parsing uh but is actually uh is actually not just dealing with symbols but it's actually looking along the symbols to what the symbols actually mean and grappling with that and that's something that our computers are not even approaching doing now, will a computer be able to beat us at chess? Certainly, it's happened, and that's that's going to happen. I mean, chess is a mathematical problem. We'll probably even be able to build computers that actually can beat our best players at StarCraft eventually. Can't do it so far, but... <laughs> all right, well, I think it's uh, we've covered all of the bases here for now. Uh, we'll yeah. come back to this. Take us out, Bill. Uh, it is. Uh, it doubles every 18 months. Okay. That was it. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Thank you for listening to another episode of Trekosophy. Be sure to check us out at our website, www.trekosophy.com. You know, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, uh, send us an email at uh, trekosophy at gmail.com. And for all you reviewers who are uh, posting reviews and comments on iTunes, thank you for your input and keep listening to the show and we'll do our best to try to make you happy or brainwash you into believing you're already happy. Yeah, that's a bad joke. Shouldn't go that way. <laughs> Anywho, thank you so much for joining us for another night. Uh, we'll see you again next time. Computer and program. So that's what I'm wondering. It's like first you got the Mayan calendar. Then you got the the, the uh, destruction of Twinkies. Now you got this Giza alignment going down. When are the cats um, and dogs going to start living together? Yeah, you'll have to ask my wife about that. It's already happening. Uh-oh. Ooh, Christmas in Star Trek. Finally. Pinky, are you pondering what I'm pondering? I think so, Wayne, but where are we going to find a chicken in a miniskirt at this time of night? Disease of the internet. Supposedly is the end of civilization as we know it. Well, that's funny because I feel fine. We need to get out uh, Dungeons and Discourse, the philosophy D20 game. We, we feed the bear. We're not supposed to feed the wild animals and we do it anyway. So we're still finding our feet. We're still in the first season. <laughs> we haven't killed off Tasha yet, but we're still in the first season here. The Trouble with Tribbles was apparently originally billed as the Star Trek Christmas episode. It's the gift uh, that keeps on giving. Holodeck. Good morning, Vietnam!
You have avenues, Baba, huh? Hooray for piracy! Yes, philosophy is contagious. You're a philosopher now. Mumbo jumbo, ooga booga hoo ha. Did uh, anybody ever actually play the Turbo Graphics 16? I did. I had a Turbo Graphics 16 with the CD add-on. You had a tur. Wow. John Delancey is totally obsessed with bronies. What's uh, its name and how many heads does it have? What are you thinking, Bill? The same thing I think every night, Pinky. I'm having trouble remembering anything at the moment. <laughs>